Thanks, as Karina said, I'm definitely not Greg Reed. And one of the reasons Greg um, had to be an apology today is because he actually was on a teleconference this morning talking about the task force on antimicrobial resistance. He's actually one of the co-chairs for an upcoming meeting in London at the end of this, um, this month. So if I do stumble a bit on Greg's presentation, it's not, I'm, I'm a late ring-in, so um, I'll try and do my best. So Codex, oops, wrong one. Codex. What is it, why does it matter? So the presentation today will look at uh, what is Codex, why do we participate, the benefits for industry, and how do you, can you become involved? So in talking about what is Codex, it's useful to consider why Codex. In the past, food was mainly produced locally. It was sold and consumed locally. But over the last century, the amount of food that has been traded internationally has grown exponentially. And as trade has grown, so have concerns over food safety, and there's become an ob obvious need for standards for both um, consumer confidence and for increased confidence for those exporting or importing. So why Codex? In essence, is we need standards to provide that confidence. If we look back at the origins of Codex, we see way back maybe in 1950, there was a first session of the Joint FAO WHO Expert Committee on Nutrition. They always have nice long titles. And they noted food regulations in different countries are often conflicting and contradictory. Legislation governing preservation, nomenclature, and acceptable food standards often varies widely from country to country. New legislation not based on scientific knowledge is often introduced, and little account may be taken of nutritional principles and formulating regulations. So all that sounds very familiar to what we have today. The committee also noted that conflicting nature of food regulations might be an obstacle to trade. So again, you see the reasons for why Codex. In fact, Codex evolved out of regional efforts to harmonise national food standards that occurred after World War II. So remember, after World War II, there was a lot of food shortages, food security was a big issue. So in Latin America, they tried to form a Codigo Latino Americano de Alimentos. Yeah, I've got a chance, I've got to go with that. And the Europeans, they all also were trying to set a, um, a Codex Alimentarius based system. And they tried to base it on the existing Codex Alimentarius Ostracus. I can't even do that one. That led to the for, um, development of a, a European Codex Alimentarius. However, that wasn't progressing very well. And so um, it was going so slow, they then decided to push that on, try and develop an international codex, then approach WHO, then approach FAO. And that leads us to where we are now. So in 1960, there was a first regional conference of uh, FAO Conference for Europe, and they noted, again, the desirability for international agreements on minimum food standards and related questions, including labelling requirements, methods of analysis. And these were recognised as immediate means, uh, important means of protecting consumer health and ensuring quality and reducing trade barriers, particularly in the rapidly integrating market of Europe. So remember back in the 1950s, there was, again, food shortages, there was rationing, these sort of things are important. So food security and trade was very important in Europe. The conference felt that coordination of a growing number of food standards, programs undertaken by many organisations present a particular problem. Again, lack of harmonisation was identified as an issue. So ultimately, the Codex Elementarius Commission that we have today was created in 1962. It operates under the auspices of the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organisation and the World Health Organisation, as uh, Karina was stated. And today, membership of Codex is open to all members of the FAO and WHO, and currently the Codex Commission has 188 Codex members. That's 187 countries, and then the EU is a, um, a member organisation. So in simple terms, as the slide shows, the role of Codex is to develop and publish standards, guidelines and recommendations into the Codex Alimentarius on the food code. So it's mandate. Protect the health consumers, ensure fair practices in food trade. I'm sure you, many of you would have heard all that. It has a large role in coordinating all food standards work undertaken internationally at a government level. And this includes involvement of non-government organisations. That's pr pr principally the FAO and WHO. Term priorities, initiate guide, the preparation of draft standards, finalised draft standards, these are procedural type things. And um, if you get involved in Codex, you'll soon find that process and procedure are very important. 
So the main purpose is um, protecting health and safety. But as Codex has evolved, there's a couple of changes that have um, happened to it. And these are notable changes. In 1991, there was a FAO WHO Conference on Food Standards, Chemicals and Food and Food Trade. They're, again, another nice long name for a conference. And they recommended consumer participation. So in 1991, we have the evolution where instead of just having government participation in codex meetings, we now have specific NGOs being involved. They recommended a horizontal approach for standard setting. We'll come to the our diagram there uh, on the screen in a while. And that codex and relative committees responsible for the development of these standards code of practice and guidelines concerned with the protection of human health should make explicit the methods they have used to assess risk. So this was an increase in transparency. And this had implications for the worker codex because no longer could uh, the scientist bodies present um, summary reports. They actually had to produce detailed rationale as to how they set their standards. That was a one big move. 1991 improved transparency and cons uh, participation in consumer groups. Then in 1995, codex became more important. This is because guidelines and codes of practice in codex became reference for food safety in the WTO agreement on sanitary and phytosanitary measures, the SBS agreement. And the only other organisations mentioned in the SBS agreement are the World Organisation for Animal Health, the OIE, for Animal Health Issues, and the International Plant Protection Convention for the plant health side. So we look at this... Um, horrible graphic of the organisation of the Codex. At the top we have the Codex Commission and they are responsible for actually approving standards that get um, published in the Codex Alimentarius. We have a Secretariat in Rome based at the FAO. And then you have the Executive Committee which is responsible for governance kind of issues. The Executive Committee's membership is based on regional representation so you have those regional committees in green down the, um, I guess your left, right, <laughs> depending which way I look. And Australia is a member of the North America and South West Pacific region, although we could um, actually participate in other regional committees uh, as a, an observer. In fact, recently Roxy came with me um, this morning. She is from Codex Australia and she was just at the, was it Vanuatu, Roxy? Yeah, terrible, terrible location for a meeting. <laughs> So there's those. Then we have the general subject, sorry, the executive committee. Uh, as, as I say, it has a, really a governance role and looks at the development of um, draft standards against timeframes agreed by the commission. And codex is usually an incredibly slow process. So um, monitoring timeframes are relatively important. Um, it looks where there's lack of progress and the executive may propose extensions of timeframes within the committee structures. So this is all process. Discontinuation of work. If, um, consensus can't be achieved. Or the committee might decide to um, move work from one committee to another committee to try and prove progress. And in some circumstances, they might also propose um, facilitators to be used to try and um, reach consensus. And this is not always successful. Uh, in a recent case with Rick Topamine, I think the chair of the Codex Commission tried to uh, implement a group of friends Friends of the Chair, he called it, to try and um, get progress on ractopamine. Unfortunately, that didn't work, and then it was uh, other events that um, occurred at the meeting a few years later that actually got ractopamine MRLs through. So then we have the general subject committees, and these are what we call, we refer to horizontal committees. So their standards apply across the um, commodity committees as well, and across through the regional coordinating committees. And Karina has already mentioned um, CCPR, the Codex Committee on Pesticide Residues, which is based in China at the moment. And she also mentioned um, the Codex Committee on Residues in Veterinary Drugs and Foods, uh, which in the US, which James Deller and I just recently um, attended in Houston. And other committees of, my, of interest, particularly to myself and perhaps to um, people with your interest, might be the Methods of Analysis and Sampling Committee, Although CCPR and CCRVDF, so the Veterinary Drug and the Pesticide Drug Committees, um, set their own standards, they do pay a lot of attention to the developments in the Methods of Analysis and Sampling Committee.
So these general subject committees deal with a high level policy and technical issues, so technical issues uh, for veterinary drugs and pesticides, predominantly in MRL setting. Then you have the general commodity committees. Um, they're more related, again, technical issues related to specific commodities. But issues in these committees um, mostly deal with quality, quality type issues, standards for fruit and vegetables. Um, how green can an apple or how red does an apple need to be? To be a green apple or a red apple or a mixed apple? They discuss all sorts of interesting things like that. Um, the size of fruit, size of vegetables. And occasionally the committee, uh, COPES committee decides to set ad hoc committees. These are things that have a, a specific purpose. In the past we've had ad hoc intergovernmental task forces on um, animal feeding. Um, I led the Australian delegation uh, to meetings on that, developing guidance on um, animal feeding. And also we've just re-established the task force on antimicrobial resistance, as I said, which uh, Greg will be uh, chairing a physical working group to do with, and you wouldn't believe the way the codex works. We have a task force being recommended by the commission. They set up a physical working group to determine the, t the terms of reference for the task force. And then the task force will go away and perhaps even have a meeting and then farm out some of the work, perhaps even to CCR VDF. Um, so it ends up being quite a process. So they've been reconstituted. Um, I was fortunate enough to lead the delegation to the last task force in antimicrobial resistance for a couple of years um, when it was in uh, South Korea. And as I said, then we have those regional committees for which we participate in the, the last one there, the North American Southwest Pacific. And codex standards, as uh, Karina has stated, are supported by FAO and WHO, who provide the, I guess, scientific risk assessment for most of the codex committees uh, through the independent expert committees. We've already talked about the JMPR, JECVA. We have a uh, joint expert committee on microbial risk and assessment for GEMRA and uh, a joint committee for nutrition. People who attend these expert, expert committees attend as independent experts. They're not really representing Australia. They're representing themselves as scientists. But the important part about having Australian scientists participate is to bring a perspective that is maybe unique to Australia. They have experience in Australian situations. So um, if we just relied on experts from the US, we'd obviously get a very US centric perspective, same thing if it was from the EU. So it's important that we have a range of people from around the world so we get the best possible outcomes when we um, require scientific risk assessment from these committees. So why do we participate in codex? Well as a member of the WTO there's sort of an obligation. So within the SPS agreement there's an obligation for us to support international standard setting. So we participate to uh, meet our obligations within SPS agreement. We participate to ensure that standards, guidelines and recommendations that are adopted internationally are based on science. And that's very important to Australia in its position as a trading country. We don't want to have unjustified barriers to trade, uh, nor do we want to impact negatively on our industries. We participate in codex for improved outcomes for food safety and public health policies. Enhanced opportunities for our agricultural and food industries ensure interests of Australian consumers, producers, processors, governments are taken into account when codex standards are set. Also, we uh, participate in codex because um, it links into our participation again with those other standard setting bodies, OIE um, and the IPPC, because we need to make sure that standards are consistent across all those um, international standard setting bodies. But there are benefits for industry participation. Benefits are to make standards truly representative of global patterns so that um, the Australian situation is taken into account and to not restrict innovation. Participating in Codex provides industry with the opportunity to contribute to the development of these standards, uh, which may be used for um, as trade barriers, so for meeting important country requirements or as reference default standards in trade. Provides opportunity to have technical expertise considered. As I said before, we need to make sure that the Australian perspective is taken into account. And it provides opportunity for industry to um, network with other regulators or, or their international counterparts. And how can you become involved? <coughs> 
well, this is really an advert for Roxy, <laughs> because Roxy is um, actually director at the moment of Codex Australia in the department. Um, some of you might have remembered Anne Backhouse. Um, she's off on a three-year sabbatical with the OIE in Paris. We feel very sorry for her. <laughs> and in the interim, Roxy's taken over as um, head of Codex Australia in the department. And Codex Australia is a liaison point for the food industry, consumers, traders, other stakeholders. So they're there to make sure that your views are taken into account in developing the positions that Australia takes to these Codex meetings. And they manage this process through established consultation um, arrangements. So they have mailboxes, uh, mailing lists for different codex committees. Um, there's an inter interdepartmental committee that makes decisions on codex strategic priorities and issues. We have advisory panels for each of the codex committees that you saw on that previous list. That's of CCR, VDF, CCPR. So if you want to become part of uh, the consultation process, I think contact Codex Australia and you can go on the mailing list and you can have all those lovely um, documents that we discuss at the meetings and input into the Australian delegation briefs. And the other thing I guess for Codex Australia is we always encourage these um, stakeholder participation, so whether you be from um, the chemical industry or from the producer groups, exporters, whatever, and we're especially in the case of CCPR and CCR VDF encourage the provision of data to these committees so we can actually develop more MRLs. I think um, that's probably the end of the talk from Greg, or from me, acting as Greg, and this looks like a very old photo that Codex, photo that Codex Australia has got of a CCPR panel, with a, a, where I've got slightly darker hair, and <laughs> a few, you can see Jason there, and well, out of the corner. Well, so thank you, so are there any questions? I think we were also asked at the department to provide a presentation on CCR VDF and what it means for you. Um, I'm not sure why CCR VDF was chosen, um, perhaps just as an example of a codex committee. So why is CCR VDF important? I think most of you will know or realise this one. I think this, this slide certainly shows a bit about um, the different interests of different countries in participating in Codex, at least it's a kind of explanation anyway. You see, Australia we ex and New Zealand both export a considerable amount of our production. So for us, trade is extremely important. And for trade to be important, you also need to be very cognizant of uh, food safety because consumer confidence in trade is, is incredibly important. So our interest is usually trade and dominated, um, dom that dominates our interest in Codex. But a lot of other countries, um, trade is relatively minor. So their concerns can often be domestic. They're worried um, perhaps some country will import quite a lot of meat, so they'll be worried about trade, but from the import side and consumer protection, not just from um, facilitating trade. Other countries have no import or export, so they're very much focused on domestic and they don't really care about trade. They take these different perspectives into the Codex committees. We, as an exporter, like I say, have a very much a focus on trade. Now, import, I think it's always, again, as we've just been talking about those questions, it's always very important to think about the WTO and SPS agreements. So look at the framework for international trade. And as I said before, the WTO SPS agreement calls on members to harmonise their national standards with international standards, guidelines, or recommendations, such as Codex Elementaries Commission, measures for sanitary uh, protection for human health. And that means, in terms of the Codex Agreement, um, we have recognition as an international standard of Codex MRLs for veterinary drugs. It also calls on members to play a full part within their limits of the resources in the relevant international organisations. And as Karina said, we do play a full part. We do participate in JMPR and, and, uh, for veterinary drugs and JECFA. We do participate in all the relevant uh, committees at this codex level. What the WTO SPS agreement does have, and this is what we rely on as we talk about for countries like um, Korea and uh, more recently Vietnam, where they're changing their regulatory system, the SPS agreement luckily has something in it that was negotiated um, 
which refers to scientific justification. So articles three and five state that measures must be based on risk assessment. So when you're developing a standard within a country, you need to develop that standard based on risk assessment. Or if you don't have those resources or you're um, not interested in a particular compound, on international standards. This is where adoption of codex comes in. So we utilise this quite a lot in our discussions with countries when, they're, um, when we're making comments on their standards. So what does CCR VDF actually do? Well, it's been meeting since 1986. And with this year, as you can see in that little um, pictorial there, it was the 23rd meeting, uh, which was just held in Houston uh, in October. And a quick calculation reveal does not meet every year. We're only at the 23rd meeting and, uh, since 1986. You can do some maths. The meeting actually meets every 18 months. And this has important consequences for how the meeting operates. So the CCI VDF mandate is to determine priorities for considering veterinary drug residues and foods, uh, to recommend MRLs for these substances, develop codes of practice, and to consider um, sampling and methods of analysis. So it's quite specific. And one thing about codex you always need to know is about process. And this process um, can be a bit complicated and convoluted. And most people um, don't really want to know too much about it. But uh, for us, work on these committees is quite important. So to get an MRL is an eight-step process. And the first step is approval of new work by the commission. Um, and this essentially is um, development by CCI VDF of a priority list of compounds that they want to get um, reviewed. The second step is actually the check for evaluation, so the risk assessment. The third step, those MRLs come back to the committee for comment. And this is where it can get into a long process or a short process. In the first meeting, you could get um, agreement, and the, and the MRLs will go at the first meeting from coming in at step three, discussion at the first meeting, they go to what you call an accelerated process, which goes from step five right through to step eight, which is adoption, uh, a recommendation for adoption by the commission. If there are concerns, then it gets parked in these different levels. So for instance, this year, there are concerns over Zilpatrol, which is a contentious compound at CCR VDF. It's a um, growth promoter. Um, the EU uh, philosophically opposed to growth promoters. So it's traveled along this path. It, got parked straight away at step four, and they'll probably get parked there for quite a while. So you can see, for this committee, because committee each only meets every 18 months, there's a, a big impact on how quickly things progress. <coughs> so if you do some calculations, the fastest that are um, you can get an MRL from when it's the first meeting of the committee put on the priority list for evaluation to coming out at the other end with a CAC um, recommended MRL is around 21 to 27 months. And 21 to 27 is because CCR VDF meets every 18 months, so in October or April, and the Codex Commission meets in July. And so depending on the timing of the, whether you work put on priority in the April or October meeting depends on whether it's 21 or 27 months to get an MRL. If you then have an objection, if you halt on the process, it'll add another two years each time it gets delayed. And so the time can quickly um, balloon out. There are some critical points in the process. Um, and here I've just put a bit of contrast between what happens in the CCPR, the sister committee looks at pesticide residues and CCRVDF. In both committees, Australia is at the moment uh, chair of the working group on priorities. So we're the ones who, who, who get to run the show for that. For veterinary drugs, it's very easy. Um, Jason Lutz in recent times has been the chair of the working group uh, for priorities at CCRVDF. Uh, I did this year as Jason wasn't able to come, but um, it's a breeze, that job, because there's essentially almost no compounds on the priority list. So whatever gets on there gets through to be evaluated by JECFA if there's enough compounds on the list for JECFA to actually have a meeting, because um, 
one of the issues for CCIVDF is it's struggling to find enough data packages for JECFA to evaluate. On the CCBR side, so we were also head the working group on priorities. This time it's Ian Reichstein from the National Residue Survey. And that's a big job because there's so many compounds on the priority list that it's very hard to get something into the JMPR for evaluation. So those are key, key steps in the process is that priority list formation and um, getting compounds onto the list. The next key step is the evaluation, the risk assessment carried out by Jack for Veterinary Drugs or by JMPR. Here, again, it's independent uh, evaluators doing the risk assessment and this relies on government support. We need to have on those committees, JMPR and JECFA, um, experts from the major regulators around the world. Uh, although they do have experts who are perhaps in academia or other, they tend to be perhaps a bit slower in their work and um, it's much better to have actually people who work in the business uh, doing the evaluations, it's much more efficient. On the JMPR side, as Karina said, Australia is quite a big participant has big participation in that committee. We have um, Matt O'Malane, we have another toxicologist who attended um, the most recent JMPR in uh, September. So potentially two toxicologists on WHO side out of perhaps 14. On the residue side, we typically have two people um, meeting in the JMPR. I actually go to the JMPR uh, and we have uh, normally one person from um, APVMA, either um, Paul or Sam. But on the JECFA side, it's a, we're a bit thinner. Um, at the moment we have Chris Shrivens on the WHO side and we don't have a person on the, on the residue side um, on the veterinary drugs. And I'd say it'd be useful if in the future we could find someone who, who with the right experience to um, maintain input into JECFA veterinary drugs so we can get an Australian perspective on the MRL setting part. So that part needs to be supported. Once it comes out of JECFA, it then, as I said, goes in step three for discussion adoption by CCI VDF, and that's where usually the debate comes in. And that's where usually the, um, if there is a bit of interest at a, at a codex meeting, it's usually those debates about zolpaterol, um, growth promotants, hormones, these sort of things that actually have quite lively debate. That's, that's not least, that's less boring part of the meeting. Maybe one that Karina might actually enjoy. Then it goes through to CAC, to, so the Codex Commission, for its July meeting, and hopefully if it's not a contentious issue, it just gets rubber stamped and you get an MRL. The critical thing about the MRL is, although people have identified they're not always adopted by every country around the world, they do actually influence what goes around, what, what happens in countries. So although um, perhaps Korea is changing its regulatory system, um, Japan changed its regulatory system maybe in 2000 to somewhere around there, early 2000s, to a positive MRL system, no longer um, defaulting to codex. But they do adopt most codex MRLs that are proposed. So they don't formally, by default, recognise codex. They do actually incorporate them into their legislation. I think that's the same for a lot of countries. So although it does sometimes appear that few countries are, um, by default, adopting codex, a lot of them actually end up with MRLs that are based on, on codex numbers. The other main point I'd like to make is science policy. JECFA and JMPR both have a huge impact on the um, policy that's implemented by regulators around the world, although it might not generate uh, exactly the same MRL because of other considerations. It does mean that MRLs are often uh, more consistent or um, less different than um, you might think, and so the impact on trade is reduced by actually having an international standard setting body that develops its own science policy. I'd like to go on to some issues for Australia and CCR VDF. And these are things I'd like to get your interest in, because these are things that are being debated currently or, or even recently. Some of these are kind of, <coughs> have just come out of the last meeting, but they're perhaps themes that have been going on for a few years. The first is some interventions at this last meeting about non-therapeutic uses of drugs. So non-therapeutic uses would exclude production aids, would exclude um, things used for growth promotion, would exclude some uses of ionophores, would exclude uh, 
your sulpaterols and ractopamines, which are used for growth promotion in, um, in cattle and pig and turkey production. And that's a big divide, and that's going to be one of the big debates coming up in future years. Of course, for Australia, um, perhaps in some industries, such as the feedlot industry, we do need production aids if you're going to feed high energy grain diets. We have a natural interest in saying, well, food safety is our focus. We want to talk about the science. This is a, um, a philosophical debate that um, countries like the EU want to engage in. So we want to promote, um, again, science is a major uh, concern for us. Antimicrobial resistance, as Phil announced at the beginning and Karina continued on with, um, I guess since the 1960s this has been debated and it's coming again to another head with the One Health um, promotion internationally and with this task force on um, antimicrobial resistance. And one of the jobs the task force on antimicrobial resistance will be to revisit a guidance document that's been developed within uh, CCRVDF. And that um, is a code of practice to minimise and contain antimicrobial resistance. So that'll be coming perhaps back to the um, committee. Another issue of the committee is grappling with is carryover and feed. So this is where uh, you manufacture a medicated feed and then the follow feed, which is supposed to be non-medicated, actually contains some residues of the um, veterinary drug. Is it appropriate to set MRLs or not for um, tissues based on um, accidental carryover into feed? And that caused a great deal of debate in the last two meetings of CCR VDF. And the issue here is Again, philosophical. Could you call it even an MRL because it's not approved veterinary use? It's accidental. Um, so a lot of delegations are getting caught up in whether it should be an MRL, a maximum limit, which is a term you might use for contaminants, or some new limit. And if you do set an MRL or a maximum limit or this um, unintentional maximum level, how do you regulate it? How does it work on the legislation? So when you try and innovate and set um, new policies it can have implications for countries in terms of thinking how do we utilise this back home in our existing legislative uh, regulatory system. Then there's a whole series on science policy that inter interact with uh, CCRVDF and these are to do with how pragmatic I guess CCRVDF and the regulators want to be and this information will then be passed on to the um, Jack for the scientists from the risk assessment to decide how they deal with it. The first one is minor species and extrapolation. Um, next is fish group, a related one is fish groups in, uh, for MRLs. Do we set MRLs for salmonids or do we set MRLs for all fish? Honey, how to set honey MRLs. And recently, or the last few years, there's been debate about um, other offals because at the moment, in the veterinary drug world, it's typical to only set MRLs for muscle, fat, liver, kidney. And the question for a lot of countries is, what about other offals? In particular for China and some of these Asian countries where uh, consumption of some of these other offals can be significant, as in lung. And as it happened, lung unfortunately got caught up in the ractopamine issue because it's uh, one of the target tissues for ractopamine and could cause, um, depending on how much lung you eat, um, acute health effects. So there's a a moment, a working group, there'll be discussion, discussing other offals and uh, participation of people and that would be useful for this next CCR VDF meeting. The last one I've put in there is dietary exposure assessment and how that might change the paradigm. Dietary exposure assessment is different between, the risk assessment part is different for veterinary drugs and for pesticides. But then you have certain pesticides that are also veterinary drugs, so why should it be different? A lot of the dietary exposure assessment uh, process for veterinary drugs I think would have been discussed last year at um, the, s the same event. But it has a major impact on how and whether international regulators can move in their positions to get a greater harmonisation between pesticides and veterinary drugs. Both the scientific risk assessment for pesticides and veterinary drugs needs to change, need to change to be closer together. Uh, at the moment, there seems to be greater resistance on the, the veterinary drug side for change than, than on the pesticide change side. But um, after a lecture from WHO to the committee this year, maybe that'll change a little. 
There are, of course, issues for industry in their participation at CCR VDF. And here I've identified some ones that were, de were uh, submitted by um, Health for Animals. I think that's the new title for the, for the industry body. And they were seen perhaps as negative things, but uh, on reflection, perhaps they're not always negative. And the first thing that the Health for Animals spokesman talked about was concern about uncertainty. Uncertainty of the outcome of a codex check for evaluation. So they're worried <laughs> principally about the ADIs being more conservative when they go to check for than they are when they go to uh, national regulators. Of course, you could always say, well, there's depends on the possible outcome. Sometimes you might do better. And I think uh, in recent times, they actually had an increased ADI for ivermectin, which they would have considered to be a good outcome, but they seem to focus on the negatives. They're also concerned about uncertainty posed by new risk assessment policy. Of course, as a, a manufacturer, you probably like to see um, stability. But sometimes, I say, policy has to change, or we have to evolve to actually improve things. And you're always going to get um, new risk assessment policy risk assessment policies being developed. Another one they're concerned about is time to get MRLs. So as I said earlier, the best time is, the best, uh, most optimistic time is 21 to 27 months from um, when first agreed for evaluation by JECFA through to a final MRL. If you get stuck, it can take a long time. And you've got this the example there of um, bovine and somatotropin. I think it's 24 years it's been in the system and it's got no, no chance of going um, further at the moment. Again, it, it got to step eight reasonably, well, reasonably quickly, but then got stuck within the um, commission because of lack of agreement with the EU. There's complaints about the number of countries that adopt codex standards, but as I say, that's maybe a bit short-sighted to look at it in terms of uh, a decreasing numbers of countries that uh, by default adopt codex. Because there's, on the other side, there's an increasing number of countries that actually just incorporate codex into their, codex standards into their into their own standards. They also complain about the cost. I'm not sure what they pay people, but to me, a million dollars to submit a package to Jack for seem to be a bit excessive, especially if it's just taking one that they've already uh, supplied to USFDA or to um, European Medicines Authority. On the producer exporter side, and perhaps from the department side, we're concerned there's too few MRLs. There's too few MRLs because companies aren't um, providing packages to to um, JICFA for evaluation, and they're not providing packages to JICFA for evaluation for many of the reasons listed above, which they see as negatives. I think we need to find a way within CCR VDF to move forward, and one of those ways might be changing uh, or changes potentially to a li better align dietary risk assessment, which then would allow potentially more cold studies to be submitted for setting MRLs. So, uh, on the veterinary side, it generally requires a lot of radio label studies to get an MRL. If you change the paradigm, you could probably set different uh, residue definitions as you do on the pesticide side for uh, compliance purposes and for dietary risk assessment purposes. And with modern um, mass spec analytical methodology, you should be able to then do a lot of cold studies instead of having to do expensive hot studies. That might allow more MRLs to be developed because countries like Australia have plenty of studies um, developed for registration, which are cold studies. That might help especially for minor uses. I think that's probably where I want to finish for um, a brief summary of CCR VDF and why I should get involved. As I said, contact um, Roxy and she can get you hooked up and you can get all the papers to do with, um, I guess, carry over into feed, um, extrapolation or groups for fish, offal, yeah, what, 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 what are edible offals, all these interesting things that uh, CCRVDF is talking about. Thank you.